Hi, my name's Andy. This is the third video on Scheme. This is about something called closures, uh, which are a feature of Scheme. Uh, it's a, about the way functions in Scheme work. Um, and they give us a lot of the power that we need to be able to do a lot of the cool stuff you can do in Scheme. Without them, functions would be uh, very dull, boring things like we might be familiar with uh, from other languages. Um, with them, you can do all kinds of things you couldn't initially imagine. So I'm going to start by looking at um, using functions inside other functions, uh, defining functions inside other functions. Uh, then I'm going to talk about um, using the symbols from outside those functions in the inner functions. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how you can return a function from a function. Um, then I'm going to try and explain what a closure is, um, and then how you might use them. So let's begin by looking at uh, this function. Uh, this is called sum of squares. So the top line define sum of squares x, y means uh, I'm defining a function. Its name is sum of squares. Um, and it takes in two arguments, x and y. And then immediately below that, you've got another definition. So this is a function that is defined inside the other function. You can only see it when you're working inside this function. Uh, that function is called square. Um, and it takes in an argument called a. And then the body of that function is just star a a, which means uh, return the value of a times a. And then just below that, you've got another function called sum, which takes in two arguments, b and c. Um, and its return value is just uh, plus b c, which means add up b and c. And then at the bottom, you've got the, the real body of the original function. So the sum of squares function is defined to be uh, the result of calling sum uh, on two values which are the result of uh, calling square. So basically we square x, we square y, and then we return the result of adding those things together. So you can kind of see why this might be useful. If you're doing some work in a function and you need um, you need some other piece of repetitive work or some other uh, piece of work that, that breaks off nicely into a separate piece of functionality, you might want to define a function inside the function and not have it visible to anyone else. It's no use to them, but it it helps you um, write better code within that function. So um, you can do this in Scheme. So once you've got your head around that, we can move on to the next thing. So now let's define another function. And this function is something we're going to use later, which is uh, or why it looks like it does, which may be uh, slightly uh, more complicated than we would have need to explain this feature, but we're going to use this later, so bear with me. Um, so we're going to define a function uh, it's called assert equal, so that top line says define a function called assert equal, uh, which takes two arguments, a and b. And skip past the rest of that function for now until you get down to the if line, and then we'll, we'll just talk about what this function does. What the function does is it, it, it performs an if, and it returns either one thing or another. So what it returns is either null, you can see at the very end there, or print error. So um, what it does is if a and B are not equal, it prints, it returns the result of calling print error. And if, uh, therefore, if A and B are equal, it returns null. So what we've got there is an if uh, expression that's all one line. The first bit of it, that not equal bit, is the expression it's evaluating. Uh, and then if that comes out as true, as in the two are not equal, we print an error. Otherwise, we return null. Which, uh, in this case, we don't care about the return value of this function. We, uh, all we care about is, uh, if it goes wrong, we're going to print an error. Um, OK, so now let's look at what print error is. So now scan upwards again to where it says define print error. So what that means is define a function called print error, which doesn't take in any arguments at all, hence why the bracket closes immediately after the word error. And then the body of that function is display A, and then display is not equal to, and then display B, and then new line. So display just means print. It means print out to the console or wherever um, the value of the thing. So the second one down there, it prints out a string. But the first one and the third one, A and B, they print out values. But notice that those um, values that they're printing out have not been passed into this function. So print error doesn't take any arguments. But print error is able to access uh, symbols that are defined in the function that contains it. So if you define a function inside a function, the inner function can access the symbols of the outer function. And if you kind of override them within the inner function, then you get the overridden version. But if you don't, uh, you can see the outer version. So let's just check this working. So uh, lower down, you can see we're running uh, 
that little arrow there means we're running something. So what we're running is um, the procedure assert equal and we're passing in an argument of 3 and another argument which is plus 1, 2. And as we know, uh, 1 plus 2 does equal 3. So when you run that, assert equal does nothing. Um, and when you run assert equal 3 plus 2, 2, which means 3 equals 4, um, then assert equal complains and says 3 is not equal to 4. Okay, so this function works. That's what it's supposed to do. That's what it does, right? Um, pause this if you want to look through it again. So, uh, let's look at another example of this. Let's imagine we've got um, a procedure called circle details. Um, and what that does is, if you, if you pass in the radius of a circle, it will print out the area of the circle and the circumference of the circle. So, as you can see at the bottom, um, if, you, uh, <coughs> if you call this function and pass in 3 for the radius, uh, you'll get back 28.0 and 19.0. Um, bear in mind that I've approximated pi to 3.14 here. Um, so uh, this circle details, details procedure consists of three defines and then some actual code. So the first define just defines pi, so that's not a function, that's just a symbol. Define the symbol pi to be 3.14. Um, and then define the next line down defines a procedure called area, which takes no arguments, but it returns the result of rounding uh, the result of multiplying by uh, pi, multiplying r by itself and pi. So when you've got three things in a in a multiplication like that, star pi r r, that means multiply them all together, and then we round it, which is why the answer comes out um, at something point zero um, at the bottom because I've rounded it to the nearest integer. Interestingly, in scheme, it rounds it, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't return something without a decimal point. Um, so it, it rounds it to an integral value, but not doesn't change its type to an integer. Anyway, that's a side matter. Anyway, point is, so we've got a procedure called area, uh, which takes no arguments. We've got a procedure called succumb, which takes no arguments, and also makes use of the round um, symbol and the pi symbol and the r symbol, just like area does. Sorry, round isn't a symbol. Round is a built-in uh, procedure. Um, and then in the body of this function, it runs the list procedure, which just makes a list. Uh, and as you can see, the answer that we got back at the bottom there is a list of two things, 28 and 19. So it makes a list of uh, the result of calling the area function and the result of calling the succumb function. Um, so this is just another example of the fact that uh, you can define a procedure inside a procedure which uses the symbols from the outer procedure in its body. Um, and the point to note here is that you can also use symbols that you defined within, not just arguments that were passed to the outer function, but symbols like pi um, that were defined within that function. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, another thing we need to understand. We, underst we need to understand that functions can return functions from inside themselves. So let's have a look at that. So we've got, we're, uh, the code on the screen here is defining a function. The function is called make add one. So it makes a function which adds one. Uh, it doesn't take any arguments, that's why the bracket closes immediately. And the body of this function is two lines. The first line is uh, a define. It, it defines a function called inc x. And the body of that function is return the result of adding one to x. And then the next line of the outer procedure uh, is just inc, which means just return the procedure called inc. So the last line of any procedure, the body of any procedure, is its return value, kind of implicitly. There's no return statement or anything like that, just the last line, the last thing in the function uh, is the thing that gets returned. So in this case we define a function which return, it doesn't have a return value when you define something. Um, and then we, we just say inc, which means return the thing that I defined above. So this is a function which returns a function. And the function it's returning is this thing that adds 1 to x. So let's have a look at how we can use it. Let's uh, call the function make add 1. What's the return value of that, do you think? Well, it returns a function. So what we get back is a function. Actually, it's telling you the name of that function here is inc, which is kind of interesting. Uh, now let's define a symbol to be make add 1. And this is a trick question, so can you get it? What is the result of calling my fun with 2. Any guesses? 
uh, well, it, it's all gone wrong. So what we did there was completely wrong. We defined my fun, the symbol my fun, to be the symbol make add one. Um, so make add one doesn't take any arguments. So when you pass two in, uh, you don't get anything. So sorry for the trick question. At least I warned you. Here is what was what we really meant to do. Define my fun to be a symbol. Define the symbol my fun to be the result of calling make add one. That's what this line means. Instead of just make add one, this is the result of calling make add one. Because that bra those brackets around it mean call that function. Uh, so now we can ask, what is my fun of two? And you might be able to guess the answer. No tricks. That's right, three. So my make add one returned a function which adds one to its argument. And we put that function into the symbol my fun, and we called it, um, giving an argument of two, and it added one to it. Okay. So we've got some of the uh, structures we need to understand to be able to understand what a closure is. So uh, let's do something a bit similar to make add one, but let's call it make add x. So we're defining a procedure called make add x, and it takes in one argument x, and what it does is it defines uh, a procedure called add x, which takes in an argument called y and returns the result of adding x to y. And then on the last line there, it returns the procedure add x just like we. Uh, just like we did last time. So what's happening here? Well, we've got a procedure called make add x, which returns a procedure, and the procedure it returns takes in one argument but adds up two things. The two things it adds up are the argument you supply right now when you're calling that function, and the argument that you supplied when you called make add x, which could have been some time ago. Let's have a look at how this works in practice. So let's define a symbol called add3, which is the result of calling a procedure make add x and passing an argument of 3. Okay, so that has no return value. Now let's ask what add 3 is. Well, add 3 is a procedure. Now let's call add 3 with an argument of 4. Can you guess what the answer is? Hopefully the name of add 3 will have given you a clue. The answer is 7. Okay, so now stop and think what's going on here. What's happened is that 3 that we passed in on the top line there to make, to make add x has magically stuck around inside this thing called add3 or inside the procedure that was returned from make add x. Um, it's been gathered up um, <coughs> and uh, uh, locked in somehow into this thing that was returned um, uh, and, and carried around implicitly. And this, what, where this, how, one way to understand this is that the the name closure. Um, means that it is not illegal to do the kind of thing that we've just done. So a closure is uh, the concept that, uh, that there is a system is closed in the sense that um, there's nothing you're not allowed to do within it. So one of the properties of a group in uh, mathematical group theory is that it's closed because all of the operations you can do within that group end you up with another member of the group instead of something outside. So in this case um, ignore this if this doesn't help you, it kind of helps me. Um, in this case, this system is closed because you can do this kind of slightly crazy looking thing where you pass in uh, the argument 3 and you use it later, even though it feels wrong uh, if you're not used to it. You can use it later and it's still there, it's still kept around. And that's uh, a deliberate property uh, of functions in Scheme that means you can do all kinds of clever things. Uh, and let's have a look at uh, what kind of semi-useful things you might be able to do. Well, here's one example. Um, here's a function called make counter, and it makes a counter. So what it does is it defines something called value and sets it to zero. Um, and then it defines a function called counter, which doesn't take any arguments. And sneakily, I have introduced an entirely new and scary concept in Scheme uh, in the middle of this procedure, which is this function called set exclamation mark. And what that does is changes what value is. So it's a set value to be value plus one. That's what that means. Um, so there is, I don't know how many videos in talking about um, mutable state and what you can do with mutable state and what you can do without mutable state. Uh, but set mutates that value. value. So we do have mutable states. And this is why I said in an earlier video, uh, scheme is kind of functional. Because actually, in Scheme you can do kinds of things like this and no one's going to stop you and that is not a functional thing to do, it uh, uh, mutates the value of value. Um, anyway, that's a, a sidetrack, but uh, 
uh, let's carry on. So what we are defining is a procedure called counter which changes the value of value and then returns the value of value. And the outer procedure simply returns that procedure called counter. So let's try it. Let's go over that again. There's a procedure called make counter uh, which has a value in it which starts off being zero. Um, and it returns a procedure called counter and what counter does is increases the value by one and then returns it. So let's make one. So let's define a symbol called counter, my counter one, which uh, is the result of calling the make counter function. Uh, what happens when we call this function? Well, it returns the value of value. So once we've run this function, what is the value of value going to be? Well, it started off zero, and then inside the uh, the counter procedure, it was incremented. It was set to be the value plus one. So what happens when we call it again? Whoa. Well, that makes sense, right? So the this this symbol my counter holds onto a reference to a function which has a closure, uh, and what and part of that closure is this value value, and uh, it sticks around. It stays with this procedure the whole way through. So um, when you call it again, it increases the value of value again, and, and returns it. And uh, you can keep going. It, it holds on to it. So this, this number, which started off as 0 and has come through and is now 3, it belongs to this procedure. It is, it is part of the closure of this procedure. So let's define another symbol, which is the result of calling make counter again. So what's the answer when we run uh, the, uh, this symbol, my counter 2, as a procedure? Well, it's the same as what we did before. It's 1. The question that may well be in your mind is what's happened to my counter 1? Um, what's happened to that value that was hanging around with my counter 1? Well, the answer is it's independent. So every time you call make counter and then return a procedure from it, uh, that procedure gets its own closure. So my counter 2 and my counter 1 are quite happily um, holding on to different values of this symbol value. They each have their own closure because when you called make counter again you got another closure. So let's have a look at one other way we might use it. So uh, we had an example of a bit you can count, you can keep independent counts going. Here's another example of how you might use it and I do this kind of thing a lot in uh, JavaScript. So the first thing we need to do is talk about a function which I'm calling shout uh, which uh, we, are, we want to test. So before we test it let's have a look at what it is. So here's a function it's called shout. It takes in two um, arguments. One is called display fun, and one is called tuxt. Let me just check. I'm plugged in. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what shout does is it uses the display function that you passed in, which could be, you know, it's like a print function of some kind. Um, it uses it to display the result of this whole. A load of code here, um, which I won't explain. Um, if you want to pause it and look at it, it, it makes sense, but I will tell you what um, the shout function should do. Maybe you can guess. So um, if I call the shout function, I pass in the normal display function as the display function, and I pass in the string boo, shout will shout boo at me. Okay, so um, that's what shout does. Um, so now let's imagine we want to test it. So that's the reason why we pass in a display function because we want to be able to capture that uh, displayed value instead of printing it out uh, and test it. So let's define a test. Let's call it test shout displays uppercase, which uh, is an intended to be a um, behavior driven development style test name. Um, so it states the requirement. The requirement is that shout displays what you pass it in uppercase. So um, let's define a symbol called displayed. That's going to collect what was uh, displayed. Let's define that symbol uh, and make it the empty string. And then let's define a fake display function, uh, which we're going to pass in as that first argument to shout. So it's going to collect the, the displayed value. So this function is called fake display. Um, and it takes in an argument called tuxt and what it does is it sets that symbol displayed to the value tuxt 
Um, so the symbol displayed is from the from the outer context as part of the closure of this function if uh, if it was returned. Um, so what we do then is uh, once we've got that setup set up, we then call the shout function. So we're talking about the second last line here. So we call the shout function. We pass in the fake display function as our display function, and we pass in a string hello Andy uh, to it, and then we use the assert equal procedure we defined earlier to say the displayed function, uh, sorry, displayed symbol um, should be HELLO ANDY! Um, and this test passes when you run it. So uh, what that means is nothing gets printed out. If the test had failed it would have printed out um, you know, something is not equal to something. Um, so we're not really using the closure here, we're using the outer scope. The reason I wanted to use this um, example is this is something I do a lot in JavaScript. I have a test function um, I have a variable that I set to null or something at the beginning uh, and then I, I provide some kind of function which is overriding some function of the thing I'm testing um, and in that bit of test code I set the variable that I originally created and, and set to null to something useful and then at the end of the test function I check that uh, that it's not still null, that it was set to the thing I expected it to be set to. Um, it's a really nice way of working which uh, is particularly good for this kind of highly dynamic language like JavaScript or Scheme. Okay, so now we're going to get to the hard bit. Okay, so this is another use of the closure of a function, and what it is, what it's going to be, you, you may find it hard to accept, but this is going to be a simulation of a class in Scheme. So Scheme doesn't have classes, it only has functions, uh, also called procedures, seemingly interchangeably by me in these videos. Um, uh, but we can, we don't care, we don't need classes because we can make them. We can write a function which simulates uh, a class. And uh, bear in mind, we can, we, we can do a much better job uh, of making this easy to use than what I've done here. Um, what I've done here is, um, it's supposed to be simple for you to understand now, but if we were really doing this we'd make it a lot easier. Um, to use to make a new class or something like that. But anyway, we're going to define a, a, uh, a class which we could think of as being called balance or bal. Um, so there were, uh, there's, it, this class has a constructor, and the constructor is this function make balance. Uh, and the constructor really contains the definition of the class. There's nothing else for you to wait for. This is it. Uh, this is the class. Um, but the way the way you need to think of it is that this is the constructor but uh, it also defines the class. So um, the reason I say it's the constructor is because you call this function to make a new one of this class. So you call make balance and the return value of that is a balance object. So enough waffling. Uh, the first thing uh, in this function is this define value zero. That means that there's, there's going to be um, this symbol defined which is called value and the other procedures uh, inside here are going to have access to this value thing in their closure. So um, the rest of the body of this function is uh, a big definition of a function called bal, and then at the very bottom we return this function called bal. So the make balance function returns a function called bal. And the bal function takes in one argument, which will be a string, which is called method. And if you skip down three lines, um, you'll see the body of this function which is the if part. So there, there's a couple of methods get, that get defined, uh, functions that get defined that we'll come to in a minute. But the body of this function is this if expression. So um, you've passed in method to this function bal, and what this function does is it checks what method is equal to. So if method is equal to add, it returns something called add method. Otherwise, it returns something called get method. So you, I would expect normally you would pass in the string get and, and get the get method, but actually you can pass in anything except add. So that's just a detail. So there's a function which takes in a string, which is either add or get, and depending on that, it returns another function. So we've got three layers of this now. We've got an outside function which returns something called bal, and bal will return you either the add method or the get method. Follow me so far. So what does the add method do? Well, the add method takes an argument called x, and it sets value to be value plus x. And what about the get method? Well, the get method takes no arguments, and it returns you value. So hopefully this will make sense when we see it being used. So let, first of all, let's make a symbol called a, 
which is one of these balance objects. So um, A is going to be set to the bal that got returned from make balance. Now we're going to call A, because A is a procedure, we're going to call A with the string get. What's the answer, do you think? Well, the answer is uh, a procedure called, called get method. Okay, so what's the use of this? Okay, so what happens when we call the result of calling A with the string get? So that means call this get method, right? The answer is zero, which is the current value of val in the closure of A. With me so far. Um, so what happens when we call A with the string add? So we get back a procedure which is called add method. And then we run that procedure with the argument 3. Well, nothing happens. And then when we ask for get again, the same, exactly the same as above. What's the answer now? Should be able to predict 3. So let's make a B the same way. So this is another balance. Let's, call it, let's get. We get 0. Let's add minus 1. Let's get the value. That's minus 1. And just to round the point home, A and B are different. They have different closures, so they have a completely different version of value inside them. So when we get A, we're still 3, but when we get B, we're minus 1. So what we've done there is we've made a method called add and a method called get um, in a class um, called balance, or which is defined by the procedure make balance. Okay, and that is equivalent in functionality to um, a class apart from virtual functions and things, which incidentally you probably could do uh, using some terribly clever methods. So let me just go back to the definition of this and say one more time what it does, um, and then I'll stop waffling. So this is a function which returns a function called bal, and the bal function takes in a string which tells you what to do. And if you pass in add, it gives you back the add method. If you pass in get, it gives you back the get method. And the add method adds something to this value symbol. And the value symbol is defined right the way on the outside at the top, which means it's part of the closure of the bal function that we're returning. So add can change that value using the set, and get can just return you that value um, as is. And you can use it by uh, calling, calling the result of make balance as a procedure and passing in a string and then getting that, that thing back that you've got back is a procedure which you can then call and you get the answer. If you get that, you're getting a long way. And that's it for today.